And that's that was a terrible one. Amy, you're better at this saying goodbye than I am. I can't say <laughs> goodbye. Goodbyes are hard. Goodbyes it's are hard. hard I know. <laughs> it's hard to say goodbye, it's my so love. It's hard. Hey, David. Hey, Amy. How are you doing this week? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And hi, everybody out there. Amy and I just finished an incredible interview with Dan Souza, who was the editor-in-chief of Cook's Illustrated. He has so many great things to talk about and to explain to us and stay tuned for that. But Amy, I want to ask you before we start gabbing about our stuff, what was the thing you liked most about what Dan said? You know, I like Dan love that cooking is a combination of senses Mm -hmm. and art or craft, I would probably craft, and science. And his passion for understanding how things work is something that really lights me Mm -hmm. up and particularly in his web series, What's Eating Dan. Yeah. He talks about himself as a creative person. And I think you can see that with what he does for the series, What's Eating Dan. But also he is a moth contributor. So he's on Moth Radio Hour and he tells these incredibly funny, very funny stories. I mean, one of the ones I love is when his mouth was wired shut for an entire summer when he was a teenager. It's absolutely hysterical. (laughs) So you'll be hearing more about that and more from Dan later on. But Amy, how was your week? My week was good. And, you know, I had a moment where I was reminded of what cooking does. Uh, I had some bananas that were Mm overripe. We eat a lot of bananas, but these ones didn't get eaten. And it was about eight o'clock. And I just thought, why don't I make some banana bread? And my family was so excited. And, you, you know, I just whipped it up. It was really quick. Put it in the oven. All of a sudden, the house smells amazing. And then we were sitting, you know, in front of the TV, finishing up watching something with warm banana bread at nine o'clock, 9.30. And boy, it was just that moment of like, oh, yeah, this is why cooking matters. Yeah, it doesn't get any better than that, does it? You use no. up food, you have great things to eat, and it brings everybody together. And that is yeah. is a little bit of the magic of food. Yeah, it is. How about you? How was your cooking week? My cooking week was... You know, it was embarrassing. Let's just say that. That's the word, embarrassing. I had an embarrassing week. I'm sorry, but I did. How was it embarrassing? Actually, and let me tell you, I I put some spelt flour in my banana Uh bread, and it did make it a little heavy. So I'm not perfect here. (laughs) Oh, I I feel so much better now. You're not perfect. (laughs) Surprise! (laughs) Um, So yeah, wait, what happened? Why were you embarrassed? Well, we have this grill. We've had it for quite a long time, and it is... Every year, it's just gotten weaker and weaker. It's like we're watching it on its very long march to death. And it doesn't get up to the same temperature that it used to. And we had guests coming over, and they were our cat Gracie's original family. They're the ones who fostered Gracie. So we wanted Mm -hmm. to impress them with how well Gracie's doing and also, you know, how well we cook. And I was making skirt steak with chimichurri. And because we didn't know if the grill was going to work this time, because it can be temperamental, we had to set all the pans up inside and set everything outside for the grill. And my partner, whom I affectionately call the one who was originally the one who brings me love, joy, and happiness on a daily basis, daily basis went away very quickly. And then love, joy, and (laughs) happiness depends what day it is. So I just call him the one. Uh, Decided that before the guest came, he would clean the grill. So he was taking it all apart. So there's all these things lying all over the patio. And I'm thinking, this is a disaster. And he starts using a wire brush and cleaning everything. And lo and behold, we turned the gas on. It went up to like 800 degrees. It blasted. And I'm like, oh, my God. All these years, we didn't clean our grill. And I was about to basically buy a new one. And that was my solution. Everything doesn't work. Buy something new. Uh, And so I was a little embarrassed. Our guests didn't know that. But we were kind of ashamed. Our heads hung very low. But it ended up being a very Mm -hmm. good dinner. And they loved seeing Gracie. So that was oh, kind of great. my little weekend. Yeah, you know, I've I've come to learn to clean the grill at the end of every mm-hmm. season. And boy, it's amazing what builds up on there in just one yeah. summer. Who looks at instruction manuals to say clean the grill at the end of the season? <laughs> no. Never dawned I on don't. me. It's like six or eight years. We've never once cleaned that <laughs> yeah. grill underneath. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you learned something this week. I learned something mm-hmm. this week. And now we're about to talk to someone who can teach us a whole lot today. Let's take a listen to Dan Souza. So, Dan, you know, we do our research, you know, on our guests and we 
scour the internet for all kinds of information. Oh, no. And first of all, I want to congratulate you on having a net worth of 16 to $20 million <laughs> at your age. Congratulations. <laughs> that is amazing. Wow. Wow. I, I'm doing something wrong if that's what the internet thinks I make. <laughs> it <laughs> is. what I do make. <laughs> and apparently you're like one of the major cooking chef thirst traps out there. Did you know this? I did not know that. No, I did not know that. You must be searching a different part of the web that, that, than I am. I'm doing the dark web. <laughs> this is there the are dark. some people who are willing to send you various items of clothing because they just think you're the greatest thing out there. <laughs> Don't the let it make you world. feel self-conscious or anything. No, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Dan, you have a degree in business and you graduated first in your class from the CIA. So what I want to know is, why are we talking to Dan, the editor, and not Dan, the chef owner of the yeah. hottest little bistro in town? That's a great question. First, I should say that the like first in class CIA thing is um, always like, it gets touted a lot. And it feels like something my mom would like brag about, you know, well, well Dan got first in class from CIA, but like I keep it on there cause I know that it's a good thing to have, but there's always a little like wrinkle of embarrassment to it, but. Oh, yeah, you mean great... you weren't embarrassed already? <laughs> yeah, if I were, exactly. Yeah, if I was already. You know, so it, it's a great question. Uh, when I started on my culinary path, which began of all places, it began in Hungary in this really rural village where I was teaching English and I can go much more into detail on that story if you want, but I, pretty much always imagined myself opening up something small and having that full control and and serving people in that kind of angle of hospitality and everything that I loved. As I got more into cooking and spent time in restaurants and culinary school, I realized that, I mean, one, like I was a decent line cook, but not the best. You know, like when you were like, I can do this, but I'm looking at the guy next to me, I'm like, he's like really good line cook, you know, and that kind of mm -hmm. speed and the ability to remember every order and stuff like that. And so I felt like my skills weren't totally lining up. I mean, I've always been a writer and I think more of a creative kind of humanities person. And in college, I was like, what do I do? You know, so I just like, I just chose a path, but I think if I could do it all over again, I probably would have been an English major and, you know, gone a lot deeper into humanity. So yeah, in my last restaurant job, I was just like, I want to be writing and I want to be doing all this. Like, where could I possibly combine mm -hmm. all my interests? And I'm from Massachusetts originally and I knew Cooks Illustrated. My mom always got the magazine and I knew it was like in mm -hmm. the Boston area. And so I ended up checking it out and I was like, wait a minute. Like I stayed for like two days just to kind of stage. <laughs> and I was like, so I'm going to work with food um, and, right. and develop recipes. They're going to give me all this food to work with. But then I get to write stories about it and I get to like dig in on the science. And it was just like, okay, yeah, this is <laughs> mm -hmm. this makes sense for me. So where did the science <laughs> come from? That's interesting because yeah. you are known as Mr. Science Man. Where did that come from? It's funny because I always loved science growing up and I, I did really well in science classes, but I never... I don't know. I never felt like a passion for it. I never was like, this is going to be my direction and I want to go to you know, med school or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I got really into food that all of that came rushing back that I was like, I don't know, there was something about being able to apply it to something really tangible and something that I could, I mean, honestly, that I could eat. you know. And so experiments right. became so much more enjoyable. And I felt like it was giving you the ability to, to one, kind of unlock some secrets in cooking. But more than that, and I think this is what we try to get across, you know, in what we do at Cooks Illustrated is like, it makes you a better cook and it makes you like less reliant on recipes, which is crazy coming from me because like we make great recipes, but it really does. If you understand what's kind of happening, you know, in your fried egg and, and you know, at temperatures where mm -hmm. things, uh, the white and the yolk set at different temperatures and something kind of starts to go off or you're not using a recipe, you, you know, you have more ability to be agile and actually make those decisions. So I don't know, it just appealed to me on so many different levels once I got back into food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're kind of giving people the keys so they understand what they're doing and why they're doing it as opposed to just being uh, slavishly reliant on a recipe. That's exactly it. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think that why component of it is is really big because for me, just across the board, if I don't understand why I do something some way, you know, not even just in the kitchen, I have a hard time mm -hmm. following the rules or like doing it or, you know, repeating it. Mm -hmm. I always want to understand that why. And I think the folks that come to us and the people that follow me that are interested in food are really hungry for that why too. And most of the time that why is science grounded. Yeah. 
One of the ways you express your interest in science and share it is through your video series, What's Eating Dan, which is so good and Hilarious so much too. fun to watch. Oh, thank yeah, you. it's so well it's so well produced and directed and edited and, and nominated every- for a Webby Award this year. That's right. Yeah. Nominated for Webby and it won a yeah. uh, won a taste award for best writing. Just, yeah. just congratulations. Recently. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. So you, in this series, you look into, yeah, foods like the science behind foods like yogurt and chocolate and honey um, and how, you know, how to brew the best cup of tea. Yeah. And then how celery doesn't have zero calories. You know, I cover the hard hitting <laughs> questions, basically. Yeah, exactly. The real yeah. hard hitting ones. No, but I mean, I, you know, I work with an incredible team and Dan Callahan and I work really close with him. He's video producer, editor, and there's a number of editors that we work with there that it's funny, like I write the script and I try to perform it how I want to and it's kind of my brainchild, mm-hmm. but how it's edited is everything. Like there was one time we we looked yeah. at a really rough cut that was just the timing was off and I was like, "Oh, I'm not funny at all." And like like I did a horrible <laughs> job with this, but then edited together where they like everything snaps and I'm like, "Okay, yeah, now I look good." So, um <laughs> so what are some of the weirdest questions that you've been asked about food or asked to cover on What's Eating Dan or even on uh Cook's Illustrated and ATK? I don't know if it's like the weirdest, but the most challenging questions I find uh, revolve around um, substitutions, and like mm-hmm. to the degree that like it, the recipe is almost unrecognizable. It's like I really want to make this apple <laughs> yeah. pie, but like you know, I don't like apples. I don't like apples. <laughs> I'm gluten free. <laughs> Dairy doesn't work for me. You know, it's essentially like you could go back in the kitchen and work on a recipe for like a month to answer that one question. Oh, yeah. and, but it's hard because that is a, such an important use case. And so we build a ton of that into our testing. Like when we get to a final recipe, we try to make it gluten-free, we try to sub cornstarch for flat, we do all this kind of stuff. We can never mm-hmm. anticipate every every desire and kind of need there. That's the most vexing one, you know, in different permutations that we get quite frequently. Mm-hmm. My favorite feedback when I'm developing recipes for Yankee Magazine is, you know, is the comment on the the bottom of the recipe that says, I made this without sugar and without yeah. apples and <laughs> yeah. I substituted store-bought pie crust and it didn't work. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Exactly. I love those. Yeah. Those are my favorite comments. It's great. Yes. And it's your fault, Amy, right? I mean, it didn't work. So. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And not only that, I'm going to I'm gonna complain about you on the internet mm-hmm. and I'm going to make I'm you look bad. And I'm subscribing. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's all your fault. I ruined it. <laughs> So, Dan, talking about comedy, can we talk a little bit about the Moth Radio Hour? Because when I discovered that you were doing that, I watched every one that I could find (laughs) from you, and I've been following it. You are hysterical. Oh, thank you, David. I appreciate that. Could you give the Cliff Notes version of the near-death experience story? Oh, my God. So you're talking about the fish, the fish? Yeah, 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 the fish one. So I was working at the Bernadan in Manhattan, and it was like a dream job for me because I love fish. Seafood is my like biggest passion in the food realm. So I'd gotten the job, and I wanted to learn like as much as I possibly could. So in the morning, um, there's a guy named Husto who's been there. I don't know, two decades at this point, I'm not even sure. And he cuts all of the fish that ends up on the plates, you know, at Le Bernadan. So he's incredibly talented. And they get whole fish, gorgeous stuff in from all over the world fresh every day. And so he gets there at like, you know, five or six in the morning, way before service and all that kind of stuff and breaks it all down. And I was like, can I join you? You know, can I come and hang out and and learn from you a little bit? And he was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, but so I went in and like, you know, I would break down one black bass for every like 25 that he did perfectly, you know? So I was learning, but, but quite slowly. And one of his tricks for being really quick, you know, if you go to fish market, they'll trim all of the spines and everything off the fish before they give it to you and before you scale and that kind of stuff. And he would leave a lot of that on if he was taking a fillet because it's just a waste of time. He'd just go around it. And so I was scaling this huge striped bass, like you know, 40 pound striped bass that still had the dorsal fin on it. And you go in the opposite direction to scale a fish, right? And I did a pass and one of the spines like stuck in my index finger. And then I kept moving forward and it broke off inside. But I didn't know that because everything is really cold down there and there's some toxins on the spines that (laughs) numb the feeling that it's in there. But you didn't know this at the time. I didn't know this at the time. So I was like- Completely unaware. Completely unaware. And so I went about, you know, my day cooking and like my finger just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was like, you know, the Uh. size of a small pickle, (laughs) the size of like a a big deli half sour. And it was like getting out of hand. And, you know, I I basically, I ended up at a hospital in- Mount Sinai. Yeah, Mount Sinai after a a bad Mm. time experience at a New Jersey hospital where they were like, it'll work itself out. And so I ended up at Mount Sinai and I had like a dedicated like team 
team, like a hand surgeon team mm-hmm. working on me, on my index finger. You know, I was working in 90 hours a week at Le Bernardin and like killing myself. And I likened it to like dining at Le Bernardin, like to have this team of people working on my finger yes. and I could rest. I was just in bed. So it was really like this break <laughs> from work that was kind of lovely. But it really, they were like, if you hadn't come in, like you would have lost your index finger pretty, pretty soon. So. Wow. I'm glad I went when I did. I remember having a newborn and having to have like a procedure with a podiatrist. Like it was a foot thing. And I remember being like, ah, this is luxury. This is, <laughs> I can close my eyes and have somebody work on my foot and no one's crying. <laughs> so let's, let's go back to Cook's Illustrated. How did you get from working there to being editor in chief? I mean, you're very young. To be able to do that, that's pretty amazing. Mm, well, I'm not that young anymore, David. I am 40 now. So. Um, oh my God, I have shoes older than you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's an interesting path because I, I know it's not normal nowadays either. Like everyone jumps jobs every couple of years and that sort of thing. And I've mm-hmm. I've been at Cook's and America's Test Kitchen for I think 12 years at this point. So I landed my, my dream job, right? When I started, I was a test cook and I thought that was kind of the best. That's like what I wanted to be doing. And I started on the cookbook mm. team. There was an opening on Cooks Illustrated, so I jumped for that. And that really was my like dream gig. And, you know, go super mm-hmm. deep on on recipes and be able to write about them. And I did that for a while and kind of moved up a little bit on the team. And then there were just these opportunities that kept coming up and I just kept saying yes to them. So now eight years into my time there, I was offered the gig of editor-in-chief for Cooks Illustrated. And I kind of just didn't believe it at first. Um, mm-hmm. Like my boss took me out to dinner and like said it. And I was like, I can't do that job. Like I really was. I was like, what are you talking <laughs> about? This felt crazy to me. Because again, like this was a magazine I read. My mom had it like dog-eared on the kitchen table and stuff like that. And I really never imagined that I would be in the position that I'm, I'm in. And so and when I took it, and it was really hard, a very hard transition and uh, so much to mm-hmm. learn. But yeah, I mean, this is the actual dream job now that I've gotten to this point. So is most of your day now organizing the magazine, deciding where it's going, deciding what's going in it, or is it also, or is it more cooking yeah, so and that, developing? Yeah, so that was the thing. I think this is the really the first gig that I've had there where I, my hands aren't on food anymore, unless I'm doing you know video mm-hmm. and, and, and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I have an amazing right. team. I work with a team of, uh, I think there's 11 of us now, and it's split pretty much down the middle of like pure editors and quote unquote test cooks, but they're, you know, they're senior editors. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've, you know, moved up and do a lot mm-hmm. more than just that, but they're in the, in the kitchen. So yeah, it's leading that team for the Cooks Illustrated brand in general. So what we're doing in the magazine, what we're doing on social, what we're doing digitally, mm-hmm. kind of across the board. So it's interesting that it kind of ties back a little bit to like what I did in college in terms of like, you know, brand management and, and those sorts of things. So mm-hmm. everything seems to come full circle in different ways. But mm-hmm. yeah, I do miss, I definitely do miss developing recipes and being super hands-on with it. But yeah, it's a it's a dream gig. Yeah. Well, so you have a unique lens on how American home cooking has evolved over the past, well, you know, since the 12 years since you've been mm-hmm. there. What have you noticed? I think one of the, the really great trends is, and also one of the challenging trends is I think People want to understand so much more about the world through cooking and grab yep. some of this and grab some of that, you know, and whether, you know, you grew up making, you know, primarily eating and making primarily Korean food, but you're really interested in, you know, German food and Italian food and stuff like that. You want to kind of bring these other cuisines and stuff into your repertoire. And I think that's true for a lot of people. I think the sort of challenge it presents for home cooks is instead of having, you know, like a core canon of recipes that you kind of picked up from your your parents or your grandparents that you can just Mm -hmm. execute and, you know, that's what you make, you're trying to become like, not a master, but you're trying to really understand how to make like really great Thai dishes or whatever. And so there's so much more education in there, but that's awesome for us because that's where we can come in and like do so much education and teaching around that. So I think, you know, in terms of the Cook's Illustrated brand evolving, we're still super science focused. We always will be. That's how we, you know, come up with Mm -hmm. these really game-changing recipes and discoveries. But we're so much more culturally focused and historically focused than we have been before. We work with freelancers from all over and get, you know, their kind of personal take on on what a recipe is. And and I think that kind of stuff is equally Mm -hmm. helpful as the science to understanding like why I'm doing this thing and what's the significance and importance of it. Well, yeah. How do you think people will be consuming food content, you know, 10, 20 years from now. Maybe I'll flip this in terms of like what I envision, like what we could be for people. And 
it's interesting. I think it's using technology to get back to something that we all would have had 75 plus years ago. And that is mm-hmm. like basically a kitchen buddy. Like the ideal version for like a Cook's Illustrated subscriber is, I mean, as long as they, they're cool with me being there, it's like me being in the kitchen with you, right? And so like, I can be like, no, no, hold your knife like mm-hmm. this. And no, I should do this. And you know, here's this recipe and you can ask me questions and stuff like that. And so that level of like personalization, I think is is the ultimate version of it. And, you know, it's so different than reading something off of a page. Like no one's doing this. No one's doing it, you know, quite yet, but getting much closer to that level of personalization using technology and whether it's like a speaker that you can talk to or I have a friend who was working at Bose for a while and they were working on eyeglasses that they were connected to like headphones and using eye movements, you could make things happen. And so, you know, you're hearing a recipe and with an eye motion, you could like jump back to the step before. Because I personally... Like I love <laughs> recipes, but I hate following a recipe while I'm cooking. And I know that sounds crazy, but like, says the man, the editor in chief of yeah. Cooks Illustrated no, I, that puts out recipes. Yeah. No, but I just the the action of just kind of going back and forth. I find I just want to eliminate that as much as yeah. possible, so that you're you have that recipe in you as opposed to it. So I do think that is a version of the future I see where we melt kind of tech and people a little bit more to the end of. I don't know, just having them be more supported in the kitchen in that kind of way. Yeah. But do you think, because you're the editor-in-chief and there are some different voices there now, you're also reaching a different audience than you guys were 20 years ago, like when your mom was getting it. Because when I Cook's Illustrated first came out, I poured over every single issue. I was enthralled mm-hmm. with it. And then I kind of got, dare I say, bored mm-hmm. with it. It just seemed like it was repeating a lot of the same stuff. And now I'm back into it because there's really interesting things. What's Eating Dan and other things that you guys are doing in the TV with ATK, America's Test Kitchen, is really, I think, brought me back to the brand. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, and I I would hope, like a lot has changed since I took over four or five years Mm -hmm. ago at this point, and I would hope that folks who kind of think they know what Cook's Illustrated is, like would pick up a copy and, and really check it out because it has evolved so much. And we, we're not just covering kind of the Western, you know, European and American canon that it was covered for like two decades, you know? Exactly. And we exactly. have so much more to say and, and kind of teach. And so absolutely in terms of all the other content that we're doing, you know, and what's eating Dan, but we have a whole host of YouTube shows that cover it from different angles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is so much to teach. So I think, you know, Cooks Illustrated always has like an oil painting on the cover. And I think it's, you know, people kind of put it in some sort of place, but you open it up and it's like dynamic and science forward and culturally really rich. There's just a lot going on there. We reach a whole different audience, especially depending on the medium, whether it's social media, print magazine, our online web web subscription and that kind of stuff. We're reaching a, a much wider, more diverse swath of the country, which is fabulous. It's a really great thing for us. You normally work out of this sort of famously gorgeous headquarters yes. in Boston's Ugh. Seaport District, filled with like rows mm. and rows of these testing, you know, suites or Every single person is perfectly thin while they eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. <laughs> I don't know what you guys do. Uh, are you guys back in that space? Are you still working remotely? And yeah, how do you taste all day long and sort of stay engaged? That's two questions. Let's start with, are you guys back in your headquarters? Yeah, we are back. And most teams, including mine, are doing kind of a three-day in, two-day out sort of situation. Mm-hmm. That hybrid mm-hmm. is just really flexible for folks, but mm. the Hess Kitchen is buzzing and buzzing and buzzing once again. Um, you know, we have really strict COVID protocols with testing every day and masking in the kitchen and stuff like that. So, you know, we keep it as safe as possible. But it's it's nice to have that energy back in there. And just a huge round of applause for everyone at the Test Kitchen who figured out how to do this from home for a really extended period of time. And, you know, and they're with their home kitchen setups and all of that. And we didn't miss a beat. You, you wouldn't even know which issues that happened no, in and you stuff. did not. You know, and we produced the TV mm-hmm. show at home for an entire season, which was <laughs> quite the ordeal. Wow. But having everyone together, like that collaboration and the camaraderie, like that is a big part of what makes our stuff really special. And you have so many people weighing in and looking at it and giving feedback. And then just the physical space helps so much. You know, when we t- develop, say, a bread recipe, you'll end up making 
a hundred loaves of bread over the time that you're doing it. And so, and you want to do side-by-sides and true side-by-sides is like you're doing loaves in like three ovens at one time with one variable changed and they're all baked at the same time and they come out and they rest for the same amount of time and they're all the same temperature when you eat them. And that's obviously very challenging to pull off in a home home setup. So I think our space Mm -hmm. gives us an advantage just in terms of how we actually test recipes. So it's wonderful, wonderful to be back in there. But, you know, we're playing it safe and if things change significantly... We've been really adaptive to just making sure everyone is, you know, feeling safe and, and good about the process. That's great. Okay, so we're going to move to a lightning round of questions Ooh, that we fun. ask every guest. And you can't think; you just have to answer. Just answer. Okay. I can do that. <laughs> All right. What's your go-to meal to make when you're dead Fried tired? Rice. Best time-saving trick: grinding, pre-grating garlic and ginger, and keeping in the freezer. Break off a little piece of it, throw it in when you're stir frying or whatever. Big time saver. Mm-hmm. Nice. Favorite food show or movie? You can't say Test like Kitchen. America's Test Kitchen. Just, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I wasn't even thinking about like current stuff, but uh, I love The Great British Baking Show. I absolutely adore it. And I, I'm, I yes. know I'm not alone in that, but it honestly feels like uh, America's Test Kitchen, just like, you know, across the pond in terms of how much you learn from it and how funny and kind. And it, it just, yeah, it appeals to me so much. And I'm not even a massive baker. I'm much more of a savory cook, but I love that so much. Your most beaten up cookbook. Um, Mang Chi's Real Korean Cooking has taken some real abuse over the years. I just <laughs> I fell in love with Korean food from um, a Korean friend that I met in culinary school and got to visit and cook with his grandparents and, um, I go through phases of what I'm into, but like that's one just has just stayed strong. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I would say that one. Your greatest faux pas in the kitchen. Um, for me, and I don't know if this is true, other people would notice, but it's when I just start cooking without kind of getting myself set up at all. And I'm really cooking on the on the fly of like, oh no, I got to mince that. It needs to go in the skillet right now. And it's this like frantic sort of cooking and the kitchen gets messier than I want and stuff like that. So that to me, I'm like, why didn't you just slow down in the beginning? Get yourself set up a little bit. Get some meat bowls. That's personally for me. I don't think other people see that necessarily, but it's not a good way to cook in my book. Last best thing you ate? Um, most recently, I had um, cold skin noodles at MDM Noodles over in Brighton. They're just mm-hmm. unbelievably good. The, the way cold skin noodles are made, I don't know if lightning round I can keep answering, but I just love this dish so much. It's essentially, <laughs> you know, you make like a wheat flour dough, like you were, you're making a bread dough or something like that. And then you wash it until you just have a ball of gluten left and you have starchy water. And so the gluten gets cut up and mm-hmm. steamed and that those are chunks that go into it. And then the starchy liquid, you let it settle a little bit, you pour off water and you have a wheat starch batter that you then steam into like sheets of noodles cut it up, and then it all gets tossed back together with this incredible chili sesame sauce. And what I love about it is it's like it's kind of like whole hog cooking, but the hog is a wheat berry. You know, you're like, you're separating it out. You're making yeah. noodles with the starch. You've got the gluten as the protein. And so I think it's genius, but then eating it is just, uh, I mean, I could eat that all day long. Oh my God, I know what I'm doing tonight for dinner. Maybe we should do that t- on Friday when I'm in Boston, Amy. <laughs> Yes. Be yeah. Cool. yeah, you have to. You have to get <laughs> That'd be fun. it. And, they, and uh, they also make homemade dumplings there, which are fabulous. Dan, thank you so much for being with us today. We really, really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you'll come back. And thanks for your time. I would love to come back. Thank you. This was such a pleasure. Thanks, Dan. Dan Souza is the editor in chief of Cooks Illustrated. He's a cast member of the Emmy Award-winning television show, America's Test Kitchen, and host of the web series, What's Eating Dan? You can find him and his antics on Instagram at Test Cook and on YouTube. Search for What's Eating Dan. Amy, what are you working on now at Yankee Magazine or on Weekends with Yankee? Well, you know, every year we do these food awards, a New England food awards where we feature artisan yes. makers and cheese makers, chocolate makers, you know, mm-hmm. people. And I'm working on picking the new winners. And it's just so fun because all their stories are inspiring. The foods are great. I get to taste good stuff. Yeah. How about you? Well, I've developed a recipe for Fall River chow mein sandwiches. Oh my gosh, that's a New England thing. Right? It's a very New England thing. So that is going to be coming out sometime soon, the article and as well as the recipe. And I'll tell you, it's so easy, but so incredibly good. And it uses MSG, um, but we'll talk about that at another time. Yeah. For folks who don't know what those sandwiches are, 
what what are they? Sure. The chow mein sandwich originated in Fall River, Massachusetts, which is where I was born. And Frederick Wong invented it in the 1920s. And he was a, a Cantonese immigrant. And he noticed that everyone around him loved all these sort of gravy rich dishes. So he took chow mein noodles and some meat, usually pork, but sometimes shrimp, sometimes chicken and a lot of vegetables. And he put it between two halves of a hamburger bun because we're American. We love our hamburger buns. And it just took off all of the workers in the mills in Fall River, because of course that was a huge textile industry area, just went wild for it. The Irish immigrants, those from Canada and other places just went wild. And this is the interesting thing is that they served it with French fries and orange soda, and that was the meal. And the sandwich cost five cents. Five cents. <laughs> it's like true fusion cooking. <laughs> exactly. So it's just, I grew up with it. My godmother, I called her Dina, short for Madrinha in Portuguese, would go and pick up all of these sandwiches for us and they would steam in the wrapping. And when you got them, they were soft Uh. and you would just open up the wrapping and you just eat and it would slurp and get all over you. And oh oh my my gosh, I just love them. So I developed a recipe for it. Well, yeah, you have to make it for me next time I see you. I will. Thanks again to our sponsor, World Spice Merchants, offering more than 100 spices and original artisan blends. They're your independent one-stop shop to stock your whole spice pantry. Visit them at worldspice.com. This podcast is produced by Overt Studios, and since I didn't have time to figure out an adjective to put in front of his name, I'm simply going to say engineer Adam Claremont. You can reach Adam and Overt Studios at overtstudios.com. And remember to follow Talking With My Mouthful wherever you download your favorite podcasts. As always, if you like what you hear and want to support us, leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts. And if you want to help us directly, you can make a donation. Even a dollar helps. Donate at leit.es slash donate. And you'll be listed on our transcript as well as the show as a beloved donor. Ciao. Bye. How's that? No. No, Amy, no. Sorry. We will. It'll be our 30th episode when you finally get a good sign off, but no. Okay. Bye. Bye. For those who don't know what the, the chow mein sandwich is. Uh-huh. Sorry. What? Uh, sorry. For yeah. those who don't know what this. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. For those who. <laughs> for, sorry. 